everyone, and thank you for joining our session today, Three Foolproof Ways to Scale with Marketing Automation. I'm Susie Balk, your host and moderator today, and I'm excited to share what we have in store for you. Before we get started, there are a few administrative items I want to cover. First, this webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive the on-demand version and slide deck within two business days of this live event. Second, we'll be talking or we'll be taking questions throughout the presentation. If one comes up, please feel free to post it in the Q&A box. Lastly, there's a brief survey at the conclusion of this webinar. We would love to get your feedback on today's session and how we can on how we can improve this experience for the future. Finally, we want to have a special thanks to our partner and guest, Goose Digital. Thank you. A little bit about them. <laughs> they specialize uh, as a digital agency that unlocks marketing performance for their customers. They take a strategic approach to helping you plan and execute your marketing. They believe marketing automation is at the center of a, mar of a modern marketing program, and they have a flexible service plan to help fit businesses at all stages of growth. So thank you to Jen and to Goose Digital. Let's go ahead and meet today's presenters. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, I'm Jen Pugsley, the VP of Customer Success at Goose Digital. I have been with the company for eight years, and I've been working with Acton for the exact same amount of time. Um, I am incredibly passionate about helping our customers adopt, totally adopt marketing automation platforms and digital marketing to grow their business. I spend most of my time working with clients to create strategies that we then bring to life inside the marketing automation platform and are usually meant to uh, produce specific outcomes. Sometimes these strategies are um, revenue based, some are to serve other purposes around education, uh, communication or retention. Another area that I spend time in is connecting campaign performance with business impact. This is so that our customers can articulate their efforts um, and see how things are contributing to success. A little bit about me personally, I am a uh, popcorn fanatic. <laughs> I enjoy and create lots of different types of popcorns. And I found uh, out earlier this week that Jen, also on this podcast or on this webinar, is a uh, popcorn lover as well. So nice to meet everybody. And hey, uh, I am Jennifer Blanco. I'm the Senior Customer Marketing Manager here at Acton. Uh, I have been here for just about a year and a half. Uh, and I'm one of those lucky people who has been able to turn something that I love into a career. Uh, just like Jen, I'm super passionate about customers. Uh, I'm passionate about the customer experience. Uh, and really one of the things that I have been championed with to do here uh, is work with our company, customers, nurture them, and uh, really build out our advocacy program. So super excited to have the opportunity to talk to all of you today uh, and kind of layer in some of those strategies as we get into our presentation. Uh, I am an Ina Garden fangirl. I don't think that there is any Ina Garden recipe that is a loser. Uh, in fact, I gave Susie one of my current go-tos. It's a vanilla panna cotta. It's super easy and uh, recommend you all check it out. Uh, and I'm a podcast enthusiast, you know, I think podcasts are, are coming back and having a moment. It seems like almost everybody has one uh, right now. I don't, but Goose does. Uh, they have a podcast called Wing It. Uh, I also love the advocacy channel and Rep Your Brand. Uh, lots of great podcasts out there, like within the marketing space right now. So uh, I, I encourage all of you to check those out. And if you have any fun podcasts that you're listening to today, feel free to drop them in the chat and inspire others. All right. So without further ado, we have a, a poll question for you all today. Uh, so how many tools do you currently have in your tech stack? I see some of those answers. So looks like yep. we're, you know, people are engaging. So that's totally, totally fine. Uh, well, <clears throat> you know, I think that one of the things that we wanted to talk about today, obviously with scaling um, with an automation tool 
is, you know, you can have an automation tool and that's sort of that first line of defense and how you're going to start scaling and, and growing opportunities and growing your business uh, and taking actions. And once you kind of have some of those things down, then you have an opportunity to take your automations even further uh, by incorporating integrations. And that's why we asked that question about your tax tech stack uh, is really starting to think about how do some of those tools that you're using start to integrate uh, into your automation platform and allow you to do more with a lot of the information that you're gathering. So uh, we use Zapier uh, and then we have an open API. We also have some native integrations like Currently, uh, we're, we're on a Zoom webinar and we used our Zoom integration to run this. So things to simplify sort of the process, but uh, wanted to just call out that, you know, once you sort of graduate and begin to include some of those integrations, you can get mind blowing results. So if we go to the next side, um, we'll start to think about like, what are some of the tools within your tech stack? Uh, and it looks like a lot of you kind of were in that one to three range. And that's probably exactly what you were thinking when you just like at, in a moment's, you know, notice a uh, thought about what is included. Uh, as I was building this slide and kind of starting to tick through some of these, I was like, geez, like we have a tool in almost every one of these categories. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're starting to plug into our platform and we're starting to talk back in different ways. And if you think about it, uh, as all of you have probably been in this space now for a little bit of time, or you're doing research on automation, you start to see that there are multiple tools and solutions for each one of these different buckets. And, you know, if I were to put out all the logos, you would see no white space on this page whatsoever. Um, but it's really thinking about how do you use these instinctively uh, and how do you th use these to your advantage so you're able to do more with the tools that you have? Uh, I think, you know, one of the sayings that seems to be hot right now is uh, work smarter, not harder. And, you know, that is what an integration allows you to do as you start to build some of these tools um, and utilize them within your marketing automation platform. So when we think about like, this could be a little confusing. We want to make sure that we are turning sort of like order or, or to creating order from all of the chaos that you potentially see here. So I'm going to walk through a few examples and start think getting you to think about how can you use these tools or the tools that you're using today or starting to think about tools that you're wanting to incorporate and integrate into your marketing automation platform for your benefit. So we can go ahead a couple of slides, Susie. And we'll get into some of these examples of how you're you're able to leverage your tech stack. And I think first and foremost, you know, automation, right? An automation tool is going to allow you to do really like the, the bare minimum. And that is a point of entry. Like, congratulations, you have an automation platform. That is a huge step forward from, from just sending batch and blast emails, right? So mm -hmm. what you can do is you can start to personalize those follow-ups. You can create segments, uh, you know, based off of different activity, you can start looking at how are we going to score a lead and put them through the funnel and put them into specific nurtures and that sort of thing. You can create triggers based off of some of that behavior as well. So like those are all the basic things that you can do with, with automation to start to deliver a personalized experience. But then again, going back to that working smarter, not harder, it's how can we enhance that overall personalization experience, right? And it's starting to create segments based off of what somebody engaged with. Maybe they're looking at a specific video. Maybe they type something in on Google and through your SEO, you know, search channel, you're able to see exactly what somebody searched for, and then you can target them based off of that behavior. So I think that those are ways that you can start to think about how does my tech stack integrate? The other thing here is thinking about timely communications, you know, based off of where that customer or prospect is within their overall journey. Uh, you know, you can start to hit them uh, if you're thinking about, okay, now, now we're just about ready to sign. I want to close the deal. And you have a nurture that does a really good job with that. Or there's a case study that you know that seems to close the deal. After somebody signs and you now have a customer uh, that you're, uh, you're ready to engage with, you can start to celebrate different wins with them, that sort of thing. So lots of opportunity there. 
As a customer marketer, you know, one of the things that I think about is how are customers adopting your solution and your tool? And I think that that's the other side of this, right, that you can start to think about is there are pieces within the, the, the journey that you're going to try to build that, that funnel. Uh, but then once you get to the purchase stage, you have the entire life cycle to start thinking about. And that first stage often of the customer life cycle is adoption. Uh, you know, and how do you get your, your prospect or, or sorry, your now customer, your user trying to, to leverage all of the wonderful things that you have, you know, maybe they purchased you for a specific use case and a specific problem that they have. Uh, but, you know, there's opportunity to start to, to expand and figure out how that solution is going to help you solve other problems, or maybe they have additional tools and you have the opportunity uh, to go out and start to look at how is this customer now engaging with my platform or how do I want them to engage and grow along the way? Because I know if they use all these tools, uh, it's going to benefit them in a tremendous way. And so you start listening to that behavior and based off of what they're engaging with, you can then start to trigger out messages or put them into a specific nurture. The other thing that I wanted to, to call out is relationship building. Uh, you know, that's one of the favorite things that I get to do. Uh, I love building relationships with our customers and our partners. And, you know, using these tools within your tech stack can allow you to build relationships uh, in creative ways, right? So, you know, if you're integrated with a gifting platform, there could be a touch where you're sending an actual direct mail piece, uh, something that's going to surprise and delight your customers based off of maybe they're a new customer, maybe they just launched a big campaign. You're, you're able to celebrate their success in these, in these ways. I think the other thing that I want to touch on here is, you know, ultimately marketing automation and, and thinking about your, your tech stack as well is really creating an opportunity to, to when you think about working smarter, not harder, mm -hmm. to leverage all of these things. So it eases up and allows you to have time to work on other things that are really meaningful and maybe develop those relationships uh, in a different way. But if you have all of these automations set up based off of user activity and search capabilities and lead scoring and where a customer is in their journey, you can have all of those communications, all of those touch points automated running in the background to leave you to do really meaningful work. And so I think that that's really key and something that I wanted to, to drive home here. I think we have one more poll, so we'll, we'll push that out. And maybe we know how, do we, do we think we can use it or should we engage with the chat again, Susie? Let's go ahead and use the chat. All right, so. <laughs> cool. Um, so, you know, now that hopefully you got those wheels spinning and you're thinking about uh, what tools do you have that you currently um, are using or maybe not using to their fullest or wanting to use, feel free to put that in there. Uh, you know, obviously you bet I am. Maybe there's some improvements or, or not that much. It looks like, see Bs and Cs. Um, so that, good. That, that means that, hey, you all are in the right place and hopefully we are going to send you home with some ways to start thinking about and, and incorporating these, these tools differently. So with that, I will hand it over to Jen and she's going to walk through some um, a, a little bit more specific use cases and some great examples that she's seen with her customers. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so the, all over, we're going to deep dive into, you know, just three here, piggybacking off everything that Jennifer said. Um, you know, there's obviously many different use cases that you can implement to your marketing automation platform to help you scale uh, your business and your operations. Today, we want to take a look at lead qualification, welcome onboarding and cross-selling uh, use cases, as well as retention and growth. Okay, so if you consider that not all leads are created equal or are even ready to buy, it's important to be able to determine quality as soon as possible. So we can do that in kind of several different ways, um, but the first one let's look at. So utilizing rules and forms to determine quality. So 
These forms will live on an act on landing page and they're designed to ask specific questions to help you sift good leads from the poor leads. And you can do this immediately before you even alert sales. So Goose Digital works with all different types of industries. Um, we do work heavily in the tech and, and finance world, but if we use a finance example here um, or an insurance example, maybe you want to ask your customers or your, sorry, your leads if they've been canceled for non-payment or potentially if they have a poor credit score, you don't want to work with these type of leads. Um, that can be a question that you sift through um, from an ad click. Okay, to further kind of weed out those leads. On a, on a different kind of scenario in a more positive light, um, if you're driving business or commercial leads, you can ask things like the size of the company, the industry, the title and role, or even things like revenue size. Um, I think what's important here to understand is that, you know, Acton has so much flexibility around um, around their form and how you can style their form. So fields can be mandatory. You can have hidden fields. You can stack your fields. So this is really important in the user experience because you don't want to drive leads to a landing page that it, then and they get overwhelmed and then they you know they bounce. So that's a that's a kind of an important thing to note here. Utilizing scoring to gauge interest and priority. So um, this is a good way to understand who's ready to have an initial conversation, or perhaps you need to put through warmer, or sorry, through further tactics to warm these leads up. So an example would be you could create a scoring strategy that tracks the scores the, and scores these leads based on their behavior with your brand online. So Something very simple could be they've done a series of engaging behaviors with your brand, they've read emails, um, engaged on social, visited certain high value pages, watched videos, that all can be added to the, the scoring criteria. You can then also layer persona type criteria on top of that for further scoring. So those would be things like in the form that we talked about. You can add negative scoring. So there's a lot of flexibility, okay, in terms of qualifying leads with, with forms and, and rules and, and scoring. Um, the whole point is to route leads to sales that are worthy so that you're not waste, you know, so that you're not spending more time and more budget trying to qualify those leads. Lastly, nurture those reads that leads that are not ready to buy. So you know, perhaps prospects and proposals that didn't pan out, you can set up um, nurture strategies, you know, to try again next year. Um, maybe if they've got another project on the table or, or at a renewal time. So those, the, the key here is that you've paid for that lead initially. So even if it closes a year and a half later, that is still a good news story, right? Even if it wasn't on the first, on the first try. Um, another takeaway is, you know, if you're running leads through paid ads, the targeting within those platforms, they're great. But you still, even if your message is on point and your, your ad is on point, you still need to move through additional phases of qualification um, to basically maximize your budget and your efforts. There's always going to be a level of garbage that's cut, you know, for lack of a better word, that's coming through. So the biggest goal at this stage is to sift to sift the good from the bad and, and get to that quality as soon as possible. Not just for your sales team, but also for your marketing team. Jen, I don't know if you had any other points on this one or were good for the audience. No, I, I love that. But actually, I think, Jen, you bring up a good point. And this is something that we've started to discuss is it, it's totally all about quality, um, you know, not mm -hmm. quantity and really trying to identify what's working. And I think with your marketing automation and then paired with reporting, mm -hmm. right, you can start to see like, what are what are the nurtures that are working? What are the the tools that are bringing qual bringing leads in? Um, you know how many of them become qualified or not, and then you can start to tweak some of your top level messaging uh, and tactics there. Hundred percent. It's almost impossible, right, to go back to your op go back to optimizing your ads even or your landing pages yeah. if you don't have that feedback immediately, right? Okay, so welcome onboarding and cross-sell. You know, it's becoming increasingly important to deliver on what was sold 
and take the opportunity to offer additional products and services that are applicable to your customers. Um, you know, the first example we want to look at here is new customer welcome drips. You know, we believe we run a ton of these and we believe that companies have a major influence uh, at this stage of the journey. I think everyone always remembers the initial experience they've had with companies and almost more so after the deal is complete. These are especially important for repeat business um, and where you sell through a partner or a broker channel, you wanna be memorable so that your customers come back and buy from you versus other provide, going to other providers or markets that, that they have available to them. Um, you know, Jen, when we were talking about this webinar, you also made a good point that it's table stakes, right? These types of businesses, usual communications are becoming they are table stakes now. We're receiving this types of these types of communications on an ongoing basis from companies and, and brands that we um, that we deal with on a day to day basis in our own lives. Hundred percent. I think you know we're all customers. You know we yes. are all people. Uh, you know, and and you think about that in your sales process and how you're engaging with people. And uh, you know we now as customers and consumers through you know the world that we live in today and everything being so digital and connected we have all come to expect a certain type of experience from any sort of brand and if that brand doesn't meet it right out of the gate just like you said Jen then you're ultimately you're taking a step back and you haven't set yourself up for success exactly yeah yeah so onboarding communication so the customers can understand the process and what to anticipate next so we see this a lot in tech and finance and really you know going back to jennifer's point earlier this relieves a lot of pressure off internal service teams um and the great thing about the marketing automation platform um, is that you can position these communications based on behavior so for example if you're trying to get your customer to utilize a new piece of technology for example you can create segments that tell you who has made it past the login screen who's even registered for the tool, who hasn't been to the tool in four months, right? All of these things allow you to trigger communications that are highly timely, that are highly targeted, um, and actually produce an action versus picking up the phone or having to get them into some sort of other verbal, verbal flow. Um, offering additional products, but applicable products. So I think, again, in this same lens to create timely segments that, you know, offer communications regarding other, you know, products or bundled products. So if you're selling software, then, you know, what are those other features and modules that are applicable to the customer, right? Do you really need to wait till the next demo cycle to educate your customer through a video that's, that, that's applicable? Um, especially when you're dealing with complex products. I think this, 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 you know, we always think of it as a, a traditional upsell or cross sell in favor of new business. But if we put ourselves in the customer's shoes, particularly around complex products, I think of technology here, you can get so much further, you can get further faster with that, that offer, right? One thing to keep in mind here is keep it warm and personalized. I think, you know, remember not all emails or text messages coming out of Acton need to be marketing heavy. They don't need to be very flashy. They can be text-based and look like they're coming from the original rep. You know, the key is, is that you can send 50 instead of one hand-typed one. So lots of, lots of uh, time taken off your back from a, yeah. from a service perspective. We, we definitely utilize that. And I know we have customers that utilize that within like the, the act on anywhere sales tool as well. Uh, you know, so as a marketer, you can help, uh, or I'm assuming I'm talking to a lot of marketers here, you can help make sure that that message is consistent by writing some of those emails, even though they're going to be sent from 
uh, and signed by, you know, one of those, th those account executives or somebody on your services team or something along those lines. But just to make sure that you are keeping that message consistent, you can preload those in there, uh, trigger them off or allow your sales team to easily plug them in and send them on their way. Um, so not only is it keeping your message on point, but again, it goes back to alleviating some of the time. So your, your team doesn't have to worry about writing those emails they can just easily have that be sent off and it's a great connection and, and point that you can make uh, and touch point that you'd have with that contact. Yep. So we go into retention and growth. Um, so, you know, when it comes to growth, we often always think about net new business. We're not actually critically thinking about strategies that stop the customer churn. So to me, these three bullet points are always about being proactive versus reactive. And I think we've all been in businesses for a very long time that our reactive marketing teams are, you know, historically very reactive. And I think that utilizing the platform to your advantage, you know, is just further hitting home the point of moving from proactive to, um, you know, reactive to proactive, sorry. So going with this, I think, you know, act on is a powerful communication tool, I think to its finest. Um, use it to get ahead of your renewal communications, both internally and externally. So in your business, you might need to start that process at 120 days out, maybe your renewal, process isn't straightforward. So there's there's information that you that you need to gather. Um, the point is, is that you can create these programs using the data that you have on your customer base to power smart touch points, highly personalized. You know, maybe you want to do a customer survey at that point. Maybe you want to reward them, like Jennifer mentioned earlier, ton of different strategies that you can do there. I think that these this is not meant to replace the relationship. It's meant to augment the relationship it also helps give visibility into management and the C-suite, as well as, you know, the rest of the team that this, this, this process is happening, right? So management doesn't need to think, well, you know, where, where is the, you know, what, what's the process here on these 20 growth accounts? Has anybody talked to them? Has anybody engaged with them? So again, lots, all of the data that's flowing through these platforms is highly visible. I think, you know, educate your customers through the use of integrated webinars, landing pages, and videos. We've all felt good when consume, you know, we consume valuable information from companies that we already buy from, makes us feel proud about the decision that we, that we made. So, you know, education strategies will act as a self-serve tool, enabling your service team, again, to field and focus on other valuable client interactions versus you know, calling in for something that they could have answered themselves on an FAQ page built and act on, for example. Um, you know, implement strategies to ask for referrals from your most valued customers. Um, what's important here is we've talked a lot about the power that Acton has for segmentation. Equally, it has the same amount of power to suppress communications from certain contacts that you decide don't you don't want to ask referrals from that maybe that VIP suite or that one salesperson who has a book of business that you don't want to you don't want to engage with so or a region that's not applicable to so there's so much power in terms of the the suppression there as well so i think like that's that's kind of these three you know, use cases in a nutshell. Um, I think this, you know, hopefully this got you guys thinking a little bit about how you can impact the customer journey, how you can alleviate pressure on your service team. Um, you know, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, the world obviously, as we all know, it has changed. I think remote hybrid work environments are probably going to be indefinite. So this is, again, all more reason to have this independent business flow, you know, from from full on from right, right at the point of sale all the way or before that all the way into, you know, renewal and growth. So yeah. Awesome. Uh, I definitely echo everything that, that you were saying, Jen. And I think, you know, 
to that to that end we hope that we got you thinking a little bit differently and maybe a little bit more outside of the box or or inspired you uh, as you're thinking of how can i enhance the programs that i have today or what are programs that i don't have running that i should have running and uh you know really appreciate jen coming and joining us and also the fact that you know you all let us talk about the entire kind of customer life cycle. Uh, we really went through from lead qualification all the way through what that customer journey can look like and, and getting advocates and then leading back into growing your business. So I think there's a there's obviously a ton of opportunity. Jen and I are both passionate about the customer experience. We're both passionate about marketing automation, um, but uh, would, would love to kind of open it up now, see if there are any questions that we can answer. I think that we have a little bit of time, but uh, you know, thank you all so much for joining us today and and hopefully we inspired you yeah we do have a couple questions that came through um so jennifer uh well both of you <laughs> the first... jennifer, so that's okay. i know right <laughs> Uh, so this is kind of what you had just touched on. Have you seen a shift with your customers and, and how have they changed post pandemic? Yeah, so I, I can answer this one, Jennifer, if you want to piggyback off me later or after. I think that we've seen, um, a, you know, a dramatic increase in content production. So this is definitely very visible, not just in volume, but the types of content and series of content versus one and one and done sends or one and done posts right um there's also been a shift here going almost back to spending significant dollars on brand awareness versus only drive only you know building content to drive conversion so that's another thing i've noticed far more video videos is is far more essential today than it was pre-pandemic. Um, and a lot of what we talked about today is more and more customers are focusing on using their marketing automation platform like ActOn or ActOn as customer uh, communication tool versus just talking to leads. So this is again, holistic, holistically looking at the total customer journey uh, um, and growth from all angles. Yeah, and I think the other thing, you know, mentioning the the podcast, like, not that podcasts are something new, but, you know, all of a sudden there's this reinterest in podcasts. And I think both podcasts and like what I see people doing on LinkedIn, it's not so much brands. It's starting for, to have individuals create brands and how their individual brand ties back to and creates business mm -hmm. opportunities. I think we're just starting to see people engage with technology and maybe a little bit new in different ways. And part of that is the fact that like, we are, a lot of us are now working remotely and working a little bit differently. Uh, and, and just, I think things are always evolving, but if you're looking for what is next and what is new and what is exciting and what are some of those trends, I think, you know, you have to go a little bit further now to start engaging with people in different places, but those are places that people are going to be engaged with. You know, I'm going to LinkedIn because I want to engage with people and I want to pull content. I'm listening to a podcast because I, I'm somebody that wants to learn. And, you know, here we are sitting here on a webinar, but essentially like a podcast is a, is a webinar that you can just start and stop whenever you want as you're like, gardening or making breakfast or something along those lines so just a little bit different how we're all starting to consume mm -hmm. um, new media as well yeah yeah that's great we had another question come through um how do you handle this in a market that is very defined uh meaning your customer base is finite and you have and you don't have a wide net to cast uh I have a really interesting thing that I want to share from a customer that I just talked to, but Jen, you, you work with a lot of customers too, so you might have some, some thoughts here. But one of our customers uh, falls into this category, they're in the manufacturing space, and they pride themselves on customer service, 
right? And so that is the area that they are hoping to wow uh, their current customers and their prospects. And sort of that like soft sell, and Jen, you kind of alluded to this at the beginning, it's, it's not, it's that lead quality, but like figuring out how to nurture them and knowing that you're not going to win on that first touch point, but it's mm-hmm. what you do along the way. And something that they're starting to do is they're engaging with their customers and they're asking questions and emails. And based off of the the answer that they're receiving, they're passing that information along to their sales reps and they're sort of like creating, you know, a report off of that. And then when they have any sort of new content or something happens in the news related to what that potential customer engaged with, their sales reps go out and say, hey, I wanted to make sure that you saw this. Or, hey, we, we just released something new on this topic, and I know it was something that you were interested in. So it's that soft sell, but it's building that relationship and delivering on that and showing that you care. Even though this person might not be a customer yet, you're still showing interest. You're still showing that you're invested in their success and sort of that that soft sell and building that relationship, mm-hmm. I think, can can move a, a long way going forward and can potentially allow you to 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 be a little bit of a differentiator depending on that space that you're in. Yeah, and I get this question a lot too, and it's actually a good problem to have. I think that the more, if, if your market size is actually not that big, that that is, that's, that is you can work to your advantage. So meaning you can go at this for from a very specific account-based marketing play, right? So there's only so many accounts that I can actually so many prospects that I can go after, or I'm a reseller of technology, or I'm an insurance carrier, and I only sell to my broker channel. So there's a ton of different strategies that can be created and 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 plugged into the marketing automation platform that keep you top of mind with this space, how you keep penetrating just those accounts um, or, you know, on the account-based marketing play, it's like, okay, well, we, all we want is restaurants in this region okay of this size of this persona okay well that's a lot better of a problem to have than oh we can sell to everybody and everybody that's gonna those are those are almost you know more complex so you know happy to happy to work with you and 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 drill that down you know further if you'd like to talk after after this webinar Here's a good question that just came in. Uh, do you have any great, perhaps universal questions that you like to ask users to best understand their intent and segment them early on in the journey process? Ooh, that's a super good question. I'm going to leave that to uh, Susie and Jen because you guys both work uh, more top of funnel uh, or work with customers that are top of funnel. Yeah, Susie, do you want, I can, I can. I, ha- I have a thought. I yeah, you, a you start, and if I think of anything, I'll hop in. I don't know if it's a question per se. I think that advice would be, you know, put yourself in the customer's shoes, in your customer's shoes. I think, like, we often always forget, like, when we start adopting technology and it gets really complex and it gets, you know, jungly and there's all these weeds, we often forget that, you know, you built your business in a brick and mortar, you know, t- mo- you know, in, in most cases, you've built your business in a brick and mortar environment for many, many years. You know your customer better than anybody, right? Put your customer and and in your in, you know, put yourself in your customer's shoes. And I think it's easy to like, like, don't make assumptions along the way when you're when you're creating these use cases. I think that you know, it's really important to test and learn, test and learn, test and learn, you know, and before I go down a rabbit hole here, you know, act on is incredibly flexible. There there's, you know, you're not going to build an email or a landing page and then realize, oh, maybe we should ask this differently and then not have the flexibility to change it. Or, hey, we're noticing that this is, you know, falling on deaf ears or we're not getting the result that we want. You know, these are not, for the most part, these emails and landing pages, they're not hard coded. You can change them, you know, and you will change them that, that, you know, you will go back to a program and change it based on behavior. So I don't know if that, that helped the question or Susie, if you had any other different thoughts there. 
Yeah, actually, I was so I was just thinking that, um, you know, when you're kind of at the top of funnel stage, you want to be solving a question uh, that your prospect might have. So instead of, you know, focusing on the questions you like to ask them, you know, really dial into your persona, your your ideal customer profile, um, figure out those pain points. Um, and then where each of those fall in into each segment. So, uh, you know, with me and marketing automation, you know, is it uh, that they need to improve their content uh, in order to, you know, drive more traffic to their website. So then uh, I'm going to continue to serve those prospects, you know, um, you know, how to create quality content, uh, how to track website visitors. Uh, so in turn, you know, you can kind of tell by solving their problems, mm -hmm. um, you know, where they fall and, you know, in the, in their intent. Yeah, for sure. I think like the value prop, right? Right. That, that's what you both were getting at is just like, what is it that you offer? And then figuring out sort of those different buckets and those different avenues that, hey, this is the solution, which like, where, where do you lie and what problem are you trying to solve? Yeah. 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 Thanks for summing that up so nicely. <laughs> That, that, that was a good question. And I yeah. think, because, like, yeah. I think Tony, as you can see, like, there's no universal question, but it's just, I guess, how you approach it and, and try to figure out what is it that you're asking um, to yeah. think that you can segment them further on. And I think it's also important to uh, make sure that whatever question you're asking, and if you were going to create a segment that you have enough to support that segment too, right? So uh, make sure that you have, if you're going to kind of go out and start to break up your lists and you're going to ask a question that's super specific and you would then want to tailor the content, just make sure that you have the content available. Because if you ask the question and somebody tells you, oh, I'm interested in shoes, uh, sorry, this is a B2C example, but shoes are on my mind. If I'm interested in <laughs> shoes, and then all of a sudden you start sending me all of these great dress options, I'm like, wait, you weren't listening to what I told you. I'm not looking for dresses right now. I really need some new sandals. So, you know, those are things to think about as well when you're starting to, to prepare and think about that top of funnel question. What is the flow going to be for that, that prospect after you ask the question as well? Do you guys want to answer one more question? No, oh, sure. Why not? <laughs> All right. So let's say uh, you're just getting started with marketing automation. Uh, maybe you previously used like an email service provider or, you know, kind of nothing at all. Um, how easy is it up? Uh, is it to get up and running and, you know, really start executing some of these uh, foolproof ways you talked about? Yeah, I can, I can take this one first if you want. Um, you know, I think that Acton is one of the most flexible platforms um, we've worked with. I think that uh, it's extremely easy to use. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, we can get people up and running depending on, you know, uh, the nuances within 30 days, sometimes 14 days. Um, Again, it's I would say it's from a from a knowledge per or, or, or a user perspective, one of the most um, easy platforms to build programs, emails, and landing pages in you know inside it versus some of the other competitors. Um, I will also say that it's. It, it's a journey, like it, it, marketing automation is also a journey, right? You're not going to wire up all this stuff in year one and and. Um, so the the sooner that you you kind of get into it and and play with it, your year one is going to look very different than your year five, right? And you'll keep building and building and building and building, and then you know three years later you'll look and be like, wow, our entire business is plugged into this thing, right? That's that's the hope. Um, Jen, I don't know if you have any other thoughts from a user perspective there. You know, I'm not uh, so keen or like, I don't have a lot of insight into that that process and what it looks like. Um, but I can tell you that I've used a, a large number of marketing automation platforms uh, in my past life before I came to act on. And uh, obviously we were already set up and we use our own tool, but it's all very simple and I haven't had any issues uh, doing what I've needed to do. Um, 
So, you know, I guess take that for, for what it's worth as well. But I think it also depends, you know, especially if you're coming from an ESP and looking at mm. marketing automation, you know, I, there's probably, that's a, that's a pretty straightforward migration. Um, you know, you're transferring over lists, maybe you're transferring over some email templates, that sort of thing. Uh, and then it's really standing up. What do you want your automation tool to do? And what do you want it to look like? And I think, you know, we tend to recommend, you know, right out of the gate, it's like, get that tracking beacon up so you can start to see who's hitting your website and what pages they're looking at. Uh, generate lead scoring so you can start qualifying those leads within the sales funnel uh, and then start putting up, you know, content and having forms and landing pages so you can track, you know, who's engaging with what. Uh, so those are sort of uh, probably our, our three main high, high touch points or high ticks that we recommend right out of the gate. Um, yeah. And then it's like, okay, this is, here we go. We signed up for a marketing automation platform. Let's start to create our automations. Um, so once you do all those things and you've started to figure out who's coming to your website and what they're engaging with, then you start to create these, these nurture programs and these automated programs that are running based off of somebody's behavior or, or and where they are in the funnel, uh, yeah. which is, you know, my, my take on, on what we do. <laughs> yeah. And I know I said that was the last question, but Ben is looking for some examples of highly personalized communications. Anything you want to share? Oh, there's so many. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, obviously people think of, when people think of personalization, they just like automatically think first name. Um, this is much more beyond that. Um, just currently, like within our, our welcome series right now, we have uh, an email that's pulling in all sorts of specific data to your account, right? So in our welcome email, it's pulling in your account manager, your, your sales rep, and their information. So you can easily have that and look back to, uh, you know, if you need to. To. Um, there are opportunities based off of how somebody's engaging, you know, with the platform. If somebody all of a sudden clicks on uh, automated programs and that's not something that they were doing before and they're not, then uh, they don't start to build those automated programs or they're engaging with content like on Act on Connect. We follow up specifically based off of what you're engaging with, right? So it's those little things that show that you're you're listening. It's not necessarily like, hey, Ben, how are you doing today? It's more of like, hey, Ben, I saw that you were looking at this article and wanted to know if you had any questions. Uh, and that's automated, right? Um, but it seems like something that's highly personal and that can come from your account manager and it shows that they're paying attention to what you're doing, even though they're in a QBR with a different customer at, the, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. An and, example, Jen? Yeah, no, I, I just think, you know, exactly. And you, it's, it's personalization based on their behavior and then personalization based on actual data that you have on them, right? So in a renewal example, it would be like, hi, Ben, you know, thank you for being a valued customer. You know, you're coming due for renewal on this date. Here's your policy number, you know, or whatever, here's your quote number, or whatever, whatever that looks like. And you don't have to go that far. Um, but if you can imagine any any type of data that you have on your customer or, hey, you know, we, we've you've been with us for five years, you know, here's a gift, here's, you know, dinner's on us, or, you know, you're not going to be able to do that without obviously that data. So something just anything that you've got on your customers, you can pretty much bring into personalization and email. And I think, you know, just, just working across several different platforms, that is, that is a very key benefit that I do see of Actron, especially if you're working with supported CRMs, is the flexibility to be able to use that data in your source list is, is uh, highly flexible. So good question. 
Great. Well, that is all the time we have today. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and for all the great questions that came in. Uh, again, I just want to thank our awesome presenters, uh, Jennifer from Acton and Jennifer from Goose Digital. Um, friendly reminder that we'll be sending the slide deck and on-demand recording within the next two business days. So please keep an eye out and there will be a survey that will launch at the end. Um, and we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, so thank you so much. Have a great day and a great rest of your week. All Thanks right. for having me. Thanks so Bye much. Bye, everyone. See ya. Bye.